kill it. All right. Wow. Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to the first Harvard Blockchain event. And I'm sure it's going to be one of many, many, many events. And um, you know, I look in this audience, and it's just incredible. It's so nice to see that, as Jimmy said, it's not just about us speaking. It's the community. And it's great to see that there is such a community building at Harvard, um, as well as Harvard Business School, Harvard Undergrad, and Harvard Law. I met a lot of people last night. In fact, you know, it is such an honor to come back here. Um, you know, I was a, a graduate of the Business School in class of 2000. Where are the uh, HBS people? Can I just see where your hands up? That's an awesome amount of people to be raising hands at Harvard Business School. You guys better be very loud today, OK? Because <laughs> you guys claim to be the leader, so you got to start leading this thing. Um, as Jimmy said, I'm president of Ava Labs, of Ava Lanch. And Ava Labs, Ava Lanch actually right now has a huge summit going on in Barcelona, Spain. And it's still going on right now. I literally flew in last night to be here um, because this is so important. This is a great community. And when I was in your shoes not that many moons ago, I was sitting in Clarman Hall or sitting in Aldridge, and all these great speakers came. I was lucky to listen to Warren Buffett, um, Eric Schmidt, alumni like Steve Schwartzman, Seth Klarman. And what I wanted to get out of those experiences was obviously, one, learn about a certain industry, and also kind of like you know, figure out, gain insight from these great minds, how their careers went and how they got to where they were, so I can take that insight into my own uh, inventory of how to do my career, so to speak. And there was one speaker who really, I think, probably gave the best advice, literally the best advice any speaker has ever given to any student. In fact, during that presentation, he even said, I am going to give you the best advice that 90% of you will never, ever do. To me, that was like throwing down the gauntlet and a challenge. So I said to myself, I love challenges, OK? So I said, I'm going to be one of these 10% that's going to be doing this. And he told me to do it every day. And I've been doing it almost every day. It's not easy to do it every single day. And I can tell you, that really was the best advice. On top of that, I'm also going to share with you guys some of my own little nuggets of wisdom, nowhere near as genius as that was. And hopefully, that will help you on your journeys throughout your career as well. Um, but the Harvard Business School and the law school students here know, you know from the Socratic method, I'm sorry to the undergrad, I'm not just going to tell you what it is. It's going to be woven into what we talk about today. And you guys are going to have to figure it out. We will do a little Q&A afterwards. And then you can, and I'm going to call on people. And you can tell me what you think those takeaways are. But you're going to have to listen to every single second of this. Otherwise, you won't get the insight that's going to change your lives. <laughs> um, you know, the, um, the things that people have asked me to speak about and, and I came up with three subjects. Um, this is from emails from the Business School Club and also talking to people last night at the dinner. The three things that people wanted to hear about, which I will talk about, is one, um, tell me about Ava Labs, Ava Lanch. Why is it so special? Why is the technology so good? You're gonna, we're going to cover that today. And then embedded or implied in every single question for last night was, where is this space going? Like, Every Harvard kid wants to figure out whether they should plan a career around the future and how to do it. So I'm going to give you a few predictions where I think blockchain and crypto will be going in the next five to 10 years. And when you hear these three or four predictions, you're going to really want to listen because it's going to affect every single one of your lives, both professionally and personally. So make sure you pay attention on that. And then third, my journey. People wanted to know how I went from Harvard to working at these great firms as a tech investor to somehow getting into Bitcoin and blockchain and crypto in the early 2010s, because it's not common to do that, especially with Harvard Business School people. As Jimmy said, there was only 35 members in this club just a year ago. Now there's over 300. And we've got 1,000 people in this room and another room listening on a telecast. 
So, you know, the journey actually for me started not here at Harvard, but at undergrad at Cornell University. And talking to some of the students here, it may be a few moons ago, but you guys are not that different from my vintage. You guys are all super aggressive in terms of drive and want to be good at what you do. You guys are also, frankly, been, you know, you're very smart and you've been pretty much successful at everything you've done so far. You know, you're only 20 or years old or something. And kind of like you feel like things have been mapped out for you just because you've been right and you get everything correct. So when I was at Cornell, I had the things mapped out as well. I was, and back then, everyone wanted to go into investment banking. They wanted to go do their, you know, get a, get a job at these analyst programs, and then they beat you up for about 100 hours a week, no sleep, bags on your eyes, you know, but you get to live in New York City, it was a lot of fun, and you do your obligatory two to four years, and then you apply and you come here. So, I, this is senior year, I had gotten a couple of these offers, so I was like kind of chilling, like, okay, great, I'm, I'm done and settled. But there was this thing back then called hedge funds. And hedge funds was this off to the side thing. There was no real like recruiting on campus or anything like that. It was actually, you know, um, a divergent path. Not that different from coming into Web3 today. It was cool, it was exciting, it was sexy, but people felt it was a little off the beat because you know, some people even today, to this point, think if you short a stock, it's kind of un-American. So it's like, nah, it's not really for me. It's weird. And the revenue stream personally to support your family and stuff would be very volatile. It was not a career. It was just something you try to, like, figure out whether you want to do. Whereas the expected value of going to a bank was great. You know, you go to a bank as a as junior analyst. You put your time in. You go to business school. You come back. You're an associate. Then you become a... Um, VP, then you become a director, a senior director, a managing director, and finally you're a partner at Goldman Sachs and you don't have to worry about anything. That was the path. And you can literally map it out in a spreadsheet and figure out when you can do this, that in your life, and it was all over simple. Hedge funds? No. It was like, you may get fired in two, two weeks. You may get fired in two months. Or you may be there for a lifetime. But it was exciting. It was like a treasure hunt every day to find new things and things to invest in, to talk to great entrepreneurs, to talk to, you know, I was a, t a tech guy, so I talked to great entrepreneurs, figure out great industry. So I remember 2 a.m., senior year, in the middle of the winter, at, I went to undergrad at Cornell. Any Cornell kids here? All right. Now, when I was at HPS, there was a big Cornell contingent as well, and I'm sure the law school has them as well. Um, and you know how Ithaca is, how cold it is, right? So it's 2 a.m. I come back from, you know where College Town is, where, actually you guys don't know, because there are no more bars in College Town. It's just now like buildings. But back then there were a lot of bars and it was a fun time in College Town. Come back to my dorm room, it's 2 a.m. You know, I was out doing what college kids do. And there was this answer machine. Now, answer machines, you guys may not know, they're little things where they keep your voicemail on, and there's this red blinking light. So the more things that go off means the more messages you had. Um, I come back, and I look at this thing, and it's like beeping like crazy. I had like 15 messages on it. I was very good at doing the college thing, you know, because staying out late at night, so I probably hadn't checked this thing for a while. And all of a sudden, I press this thing. It's 2 a.m. 2.15 rolls by, 2.20 rolls by, 14 messages, I'm hitting play, delete, play, delete. And uh, someone from Tiger Management had left the message on it. It was like a week old. It's like, the way it worked there back then was you go and you interview with like almost everyone in the firm. It was a grueling process and they filter you out. If anyone didn't like you or you're not good at what they do, you just like get filtered out. And then if you pass all that, they invite you back in to go take an IQ test. And if you don't pass that, whatever level that is, you're out. Don't worry, you guys will pass. You guys are all smart guys at Harvard here. You guys will all pass that test. So I'm looking at this as 2.30. I've been out all night. And the message says you need to be there at 7 a.m. And I look at the calendar. It was 7 a.m. that day. Literally that day. Like it was already like, you know, it was probably Sunday night. And I had to be there at 7 a.m. in the morning. And you guys know it takes like four to five hours to drive from Ithaca 
to New York City, Midtown Manhattan. I don't have a car. I'm a senior, I don't have a car. You know, I, I'm still dazed, you know, walking around. I remember my roommate had a car. So I go knock on his door and he's not there. I, I literally had to break his door down. For whatever reason, he used to lock it so I couldn't go in there. So I, I broke his door down. I literally ran and broke his door down. Turn on the lights, he's not there. You know, his bed's messed up, he's not there. And I actually, for a second, I remember this, this thing that I go, you know, this guy does this college thing better than I do. It, it was incredible. And, uh, and um, I find his keys, though. So I grab his keys without asking him. I put on my only suit. Back then, you had to wear suits, ties, and nice shoes to go to these, not only to interview, but also to, to um, work. So I run outside. It's literally minus five degrees in College Town. And in College Town at Cornell University in Ithaca, there are these hills. They're 45 degree angles up and down the streets. So I'm doing 100 yard wind sprints, hitting the panic button, trying to figure out where the hell he parked his car. I'm looking at my clock. It's like, my watch is like 3 AM. And I don't know how this is possible, but I was freezing and yet sweating at the same time to the point that my only good white shirt was now like a sheet of ice. I'm about to give up. I keep hitting this thing. And all of a sudden, finally, oh my god, this light starts flashing, beeping, and, and making noise. I'm like, I found it. I get into the car. I try to turn on the heat as high as possible. I look at my watch. It is not, I'm not kidding. It's 3.40 AM. And to this day, I have no idea how I got down to New York City, Midtown Manhattan, by t on time. I take the test, and then f f this is fine. For the next week, I make sure I came back to my dorm and hit that machine every single day to see what the answer was. And um, luckily, a week later, I started my career journey at Tiger as an investor. But I then came here to Harvard Business School. I learned from the best. Um, Clay Christensen, Innovator's Dilemma, learned how to dis study disruptive industries. Uh, Michael Porter, Porter's Five Forces. All of these learnings and frameworks were helped me influence how to look at industries, how to look at companies, how to identify them. And also, in a weird way, I took these same frameworks and applied it to myself and asked myself constantly, like, how do I disrupt myself? How do I make myself better? And what's going around the five forces around me? So I'm always aware where I should be in my career, and personally, frankly. The, um, the, the funny thing is, you know, I, I went to a place called Kingdom Capital, um, where I ran a tech portfolio there, both doing privates and publics. We were early into uh, internet search, early into e-commerce, early into social media companies, both on the private and public side, and fintech as well. I loved it. I love talking to entrepreneurs, founders. I love talking to you know, people and, and studying how they manage the company, how they led company, how they've led people. And it was a great experience. And then when my time came, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I started my own hedge fund. And talking to some of you people, I know some of you are going to Blackstone for a job. Blackstone was my lead investor into my fund. And I was investing now looking for mobile and SaaS. Those are the new emerging technologies. Always trying to get ahead of the curve, just like you guys are here, because Web3 is still so early. The funny thing happened when blockchain and crypto and Bitcoin really came around. This is around 2012, 13. I'll be honest, I just did not get it. I couldn't figure it out. Um, you know, I've also had converted my um, uh, fund into a family office because I was like semi-retired at this point and I was just investing for myself. So I had the liberty to just, you know, do whatever I wanted to do. I still had my team of analysts working for me. I had them track the addresses and wallets um, on, on chain. And so I can see that progression, but I could not understand Bitcoin. I, it was no utility in my opinion. Um, and then a year or two passes, the thing crashes is 2014 after Mt. Gox. And I was reflecting one night, as I often do, reflecting like, where could I be wrong? Because my team was telling me 
the adoption was just still increasing like this with all these addresses being formed. But yet, I saw no use case. I couldn't fit it into Porter's five forces. I couldn't do a DCF of this thing. So I, I dismissed it. And I went to some of these meetups, these, you know, meetups. It was like a bunch of crazies, if I, if I think about it. Seriously, it was not this crowd. You know, brilliant people, but it was a bunch of crazies. Um, so I still dismissed it, but like, I kept reflecting on it, you know, almost on a nightly basis. And then I realized something, a light bulb goes off and it hit me. I'm looking at this wrong. This does, is not gonna fit into the five forces. This is actually a commodity or a currency. I should look at this from a supply and demand perspective. And luckily, Bitcoin you know, has a fixed cap. So you can extrapolate how many units are mined and, and you know, make assumptions on a daily basis. So we did the math. It was like roughly a million and a half dollars worth of Bitcoin. It was like the price was only a couple hundred dollars back then. A million and a half dollars worth of incremental supply of Bitcoin a day. The addresses and the wallets we're tracking on the demand side, even the most conservative assumptions, was that it was going to be way over a million and a half dollars. So I had no idea that at some point this thing's going to hit 70,000, what force to put it into, or how to do a DCF. But I know when the incremental demand and there's such a movement behind it is so much bigger than the supply, incremental supply, you've got to get behind it. So that's how I entered this space as first as an investor. That was an eye-opening moment because I was constantly reflecting and asking myself, where can I be wrong? And I wanted to listen to the community and figure out what they were thinking, not just what I thought. The second aha moment was in 2017. It was the ICO boom. And in the ICO boom, I was really, um, it was even bigger light bulb moment because all of a sudden I saw utility. Now I had done my share of IPOs and did a lot of private investing in these companies. And all of these situations in terms of capital markets and capital formation, I thought was very restrictive. Me, the institutional guy working at these world-class institutions, had access to the private shares of the time, like Lyft, Airbnb, and Uber. Today, they're public. But me, as a small family office, I couldn't get access to a lot of these things. So I had this great idea, this global crowdfund mechanism, ICO, which I thought in the US was illegal because it skirted the exemption rules of the Securities Acts of 33 and 34. I was going to create a security token platform to create and frag uh, fragment these um, uh, private securities, tokenize these private securities, and make it accessible to everyone, everyone around the world. Everyone wanted to get access to these things while they were still relatively fairly valued before the VC sell it to you in the IPO um, and, and make the retail pay. That's what I went on to do as I became CEO of the Digital Classes Group at Shares Post. I worked with the SEC and the FINRA. Um, we got a compliant, what they call an ATS, um, which is effectively a license that allows you to do these trades privately. So from a ragtag perspective, it was successful. I was on this mission now. I didn't care anything except for making this accessible to people. Shares and private stuff that no one else can get access to should be available for everyone, not just for big institutions. The only problem was commercially, the world was not ready. And what I mean by that was if you are Uber, you walk down Sand Hill Road, 10 doors open, and they basically say, how much money do you want? And Travis says, OK, I want this much, and they get it. So why would they try this new ICO security token methodology, this you know, off the beat thing to do? So they didn't. But the other thing was a huge insight that I gained by doing this was that the technology was not ready. If I were really successful and was able to actually create an ICO or STO that was the size of a traditional IPO and the scale of that, the Ethereum blockchain at the time did not have the scale or the speed to do this. And the cost would have been hugely prohibitive. We did the math and we figured out it's impossible. This is where Ava Labs and Ava Lanch came in. Eamon Gunseer, the visionary founder of Ava Labs, Cornell Distributed Systems professor at the time, he and his PhD students were trying to solve these very same problems, the trilemma as we call it. Trying to figure out how to do decentralization, scale, 
and security all in one. And they created a new, literally a new paradigm, a new protocol. Up until then, you had the classical protocol, you had the Nakamoto protocol, but now we have random sampling, and we can get into this more detail later. He also had the foresight to actually create it in a way so that the architecture of it will let it scale even more, and we'll get into subnets as well later. He and I um, were both uh, advisors at the Cornell Blockchain Club in 17 or 16, circuit, that area. Um, it's funny because I also gave the first ever uh, talk there at Cornell for the Blockchain Club um, five or six years ago um, with Gunn. And um, what was amazing about Gunn was this is a man with a vision that was actually even bigger than mine. And he runs at a pace that's even more than mine. And I couldn't find, I, I've never found a person who's, who pushes me as hard as, as well. So in 2019 and 2020, um, Ava Laz was 10 people in a room trying to commercialize an academic uh, project. We got our first funding from Andreessen Horowitz, Polychain Capital, Initialize, and a few other people. And I'm happy to say today, it's 160 people worldwide. A third of them are engineers or product people. Um, we have offices in New York, Miami. We're going to probably have offices in San Fran. And as I said, you know, there's a 4,000 person summit going on right now in Barcelona and where most of my teammates and colleagues at Ava Labs are right now. So we've got 2.5 million addresses on chain from zero two years ago. And that's not including the off chain activity. We estimate there's probably 10 million plus people who own a Vox at Coinbase or, or Binance and other exchanges. And they ultimately trickle into the on chain stuff as well. Um, over a thousand applications on the chain. And I am so proud to say that there's as many transactions on a daily basis at Avalanche as there is on Ethereum. And this has happened because of you guys and your interest in Ava Labs and Avalanche, and it's been a lot of hard work. Now, I'm also cognizant of the time because there's this thing that bleeps right here. Um, so I, I know you guys want to hear about the, the predictions I have and how that's going to affect your life. So I'm going to get back to Ava Labs and Avalanche in a second. But the three predictions I have for this space in the next five and 10 years that's gonna affect your lives is that, well, don't forget the mission of Avalas. We wanna tokenize the world's assets. And there's about 700 trillion financial assets that needs to be tokenized. And there's gonna be other new assets that will be tokenized. So I think in the next five, 10 years, you're gonna see what I call for your first, my first prediction is hyper tokenization. Anything with an income stream or cash flow will be tokenized it's just a, and put on the blockchain. And having programmability on that token allows you to do so many things. In fact, there's going to be new asset classes. And I know that because we're working on this at Ava Labs. New asset classes that are tokenized that you don't even think of right now. And hopefully some of you guys will be helpful in creating these new asset classes. So in this hyper-tokenization world, you're going to see so many new innovations and the, and the second prediction is the economic value that is created will be distributed and transferred differently. In today's world, there's really only two methods. You know, there's labor and capital. So you go out, you find a job, you work really hard, you get a salary and you get bonuses, whatever, and you get income. And that income is basically one method to translate your economic value add into a, a, a value transfer or distribution. The other one is capital markets. You take what you've made, you put it into the bank, you get interest, or you invest in something, you get dividends, and you hope there's principal appreciation. That's really it. That's the two ways to basically have economic value distributed today. With blockchain and crypto and hyper-tokenization, there's going to be new ways where this is created. Think of staking. So these are hybrid methods where, I don't know if you guys stake, anyone stake here? Hopefully on Avalanche. So you guys get it. I mean, this is a hybrid between letting people borrow your money and getting you know, interest and actually labor. You are contributing to validating chains. Then there are other ways. I'm sure you guys do liquidity mining or you know, liquidity providing. 
You're actually contributing to the system. You are providing utility and you get rewarded for it while you're locking up your capital. These are hybrid systems. And guess what? It's not going to just be the distribution system that's going to be added, but it's also going to be economic production is going to change because people in this room are going to figure out new ways to create hybrid systems where value add can be transferred and distributed to more people and to give people choices. Like you guys are worried about a job right now. You may not want a job because you're going to go from one thing to another while you are providing utility. A job, what you do is you're providing utility to someone, something, some entity, and you get paid for it. Now you get to do it for yourself. Maybe you're going to go from one thing to another and you're going to be effectively a freelancer and you're going to be providing economic value to some community, some utility, and you get paid for that. and allows you to have your family and support yourself. There's going to be new ways to do that. So the third prediction, when all of this happens, there's going to be a lot of fragmentation, so many tokens out there. And my prediction is that and hopefully we don't, I know there's a few lawyers I spoke to last night, and hopefully they can help out with this. Um, the U.S. dollar will be stronger than ever. The U.S. dollar is now the reserve currency of the world. About 60 to 70 percent of trade all happens in the U.S. dollar. Commodities like oil, wheat, corn, all priced in U.S. dollars. It's the unit of account. When you have all of these tokens out there, you need some mechanism to basically bridge all these tokens. And if we don't mess it up here, the U.S. dollar will be that bridge and it will be a stronger reserve currency than ever. That's my predictions. Now, think about that because your lives as an individual, your families, all of a sudden you're going to be thinking, wait, I'm not just lending money to a bank. You are the bank you are going to get your money back and you're going to be helping people directly. You don't need to send your order to Robinhood or Schwab and have it go through transfer agents, custodians, and, and other third parties and then get it to, you know, Citadel so they can market make on you and, and, and get spreads on you and then finally go to the NYSC and have it done there. In 2030, I think there's a class, right, 2030, 2032 or something? at HBS where they talk about the uh, five big things in technology that are going to change your lives in the world and blockchain is one of them. Blockchain is going to be one of them. So you're going to be participating in these systems and your computer, this person is going to want to buy or sell Apple stock and she's going to want to buy or sell or Apple stock and they'll just match it up together. It's, you don't need all these six people in between you guys. And it'll just be done. You're going to create economic value and then you're going to participate in it. And the firm and the protocol that's going to help lead the way here is Ava Labs and Avalanche. Now, the people who don't own Avalanche, just go to Coinbase. The ticker is AVAX. <laughs> You're laughing. That's good. That means you guys already own it, okay? Get, get into the system. Increase that 2.5 million, okay? And, um, and just play. That's the best way to learn. It's just like there's no other system in the world where a few hundred dollars you can go in and participate in the DeFi ecosystem, right? I mean, this is the only movement where the retail and the people have gotten ahead of the institutions. If we overregulate this, you're just going to affect individuals. You're not affecting the, the, the big banks or anything. Um, so the firm that's going to lead the way here is Ava Labs, and the protocol it's going to be on is Avalanche. And as I said earlier, most of my colleagues and teammates are still in Barcelona. And if there's one place I would be not with my teammates, it's with you guys because this is a great community as well. So I want to give you a flavor of what is happening now. What is these 3,700 people doing right now and where I just came from? I literally flew in last night, had dinner with some of you guys, and I still haven't slept because I'm time shifted. Um, let's take a look at what's going on right now. Welcome to the iconic Poble Espanol here in the heart of beautiful Barcelona, where more than 3,600 people have gathered from all around the world to learn from and network with some of the brightest minds in the industry.
We're kicking the week off with three days of incredible programming, where more than 250 of the biggest names in crypto will take the stage to share their vision for the future of commerce and community powered by Web3. On day four, we transitioned from a developers conference to a hackathon, and we'll be welcoming more than 400 of the world's smartest engineers all here to build the future in only three days. This is Avalanche Summit 2022. That's a live shot of the hackathon that's going on right now. Well, now it's no longer live, but it was a live shot of the hackathon that was going on with all some great creative people working there. It was a lot of fun, and it's still a lot of fun for all of them. But now I have a huge surprise for everyone. And, um, you know, this gentleman I referred to already earlier, he's one of the visionaries of this space. He's um, an unbelievable... Uh, passionate person about community as well as technology. And he's the brains and the founder and the CEO of Ava Labs and Ava Lynch. So give a warm welcome to Eamon Gunsir. Hi, John. Hello, Harvard. Good, and how are you? I know you haven't slept just like I have not. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, but I'm also elated. It's been an amazing, amazing five days here. And uh, the hackathon is still continuing, John. And uh, I'm about to head back there, but it's a, it's a delight to be here, to be talking to the Harvard audience. Thank you, Kun. I know you wish you could be here in person. This is almost as good, if not better. And um, I am going to, um, I know some of the questions already asked of me is, what makes Ava Labs and Ava Land so special from a technology perspective? and as well as a people perspective. So I'd love for you to answer that. Absolutely. So I think what, uh, what makes Avalanche special, what makes Ava Labs, the company special, is the fact that we bring the, the, most, uh, the most advanced technology into the blockchain space. The thing that characterizes our approach is the fact that we always use the best of science. And uh, I don't think this is all that advanced a thing to say, but somehow, in, uh, in the 11, 12 years that blockchains have, uh, have hit the mainstream, in uh, the 8,000 tokens and projects that have preceded us, uh, I don't quite see the same approach. We don't see scientific methods employed. We see quite a few religious techniques or <laughs> religious uh, social techniques try to, to, use, uh, to be used to actually uh, deploy systems. Instead, we have a very scientific approach. We bring the best of technology. And uh, I think, as you alluded to, uh, one of the things that characterizes us is the big breakthrough in consensus protocols, the underlying components that power every single blockchain. Uh, we, Avalanche, happens to be the one that actually made the biggest stride. Uh, it's one of the, the three big things that happened in my area of expertise, distributed systems, in the entirety of its existence. The whole time that this area has been around, uh, there have only been three markers. Uh, one of the markers was back in the 70s when people realized, hey, consensus protocols are big, and that got us classical consensus protocols. And um, the second thing that happened was Nakamoto, Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin. And that showed the world, hey, everything that these academics worked on is actually kind of limited. And this other fellow, who, pseudonymous entity, whatever it might be, uh, it, he uh, introduced to the world a different way of approaching the consensus problem. And he showed that you could create trillion dollars or more of value without anybody being in charge. And that opened everybody's eyes to what the, the potential and gave us the dream, the vision. But the, the third biggest thing that happened in this space from a technical perspective is avalanche consensus. It's different. And it operates based on a very different principle. And that allows it to be very, very fast. Whereas every other approach either requires a lot of electricity or a lot of communication. Avalanche, the protocol, uh, can be very efficient because it does not require every participant to communicate with every other one. So that's, I think, one of the main enablers behind Avalanche's success, why it's able to be so cheap and such high capacity and so, so fast. 
Uh, the other thing, of course, is the, the system has a different architecture. I think that you alluded to. The fact that the system consists of a series of subnets, the fact which allows us to be able to accommodate any virtual machine. So any of you in the audience who have unique ideas, you want to build a different kind of a ledger. The ledger has to have certain properties, or the ledger participants have to, have to do something different. Maybe they have to be bound by a legal agreement. There has to be a different kind of a social construct around it. Well, we can accommodate that by creating what we call a subnet, a small universe that's specific to a given application. So combine these two approaches make us quite unique. That's right. That's awesome. I'm, um, good. You, um, right now it's the hackathon, and um, there's obviously it's mostly devs. Uh, some of the Harvard College kids are, are engineers, but there are other people who come from finance and law. Can you share with them some of your advice for this space going forward and how to enter Web3? Okay. That's uh, quite a tall order, but in, uh, uh, very quickly, let me try to sketch out my advice to new people coming into the space. Um, I think it starts out with the recognition that, uh, that this space is going to be very big. So my first advice is to, to do the, the, whatever it takes to understand blockchains, to understand how they can transform uh, not just technology, not just the geeky stuff that I do in the back office, but also society at large. What's happening here is not a small thing. It's not something that's just going to change what happens on the, on the accounting side, on the, on the sort of the back office side of, of large corporations. The fact that we now have means of transferring value across the globe without borders, the fact that we have now the ability to encode business flows and, and uh, processes into what we call smart contracts, the fact that we have transparency, means that we can now build a different world where everything is much more open, where things that used to require trust and reputation can now be done by just inspection and, and whatever is required, inspection, post facto enforcement, etc., regulations, can now be woven into the fabric of the systems that we build. This is transformative. This is huge. It now means that I can sleep well at night knowing that my counterparties are bound in a very tight fashion and I don't have to take their word for it, I don't have to resort to enforcement activities and so forth. This is huge. And so, so step one is figure out what this really means and, and try to trace out what its implications are going to be. Step two, from a technologist's point of view, is my suggestion to you, my, my, my humble, humble advice. Um, as, as actually a professor, I've learned not to give advice to people who did not seek it. Well, let me try to, uh, to do it very gently. You will be pulled in all sorts of directions. And in an area like this, I think one of the biggest temptations is to see it as a money-making venture. If you approach it like that, I don't think that I have not seen the people who approached it like that to really do well. Um, and even if they might do well financially, they don't necessarily do well uh, personally. To really, be, to really thrive in this space, what you really must approach it as is, uh, is as a way to transform society because there is such a big change coming that, uh, that getting into it and, and affecting that is entirely possible if, uh, if you approach it with the right values. So don't see it as just a money-making venture, but instead uh, see it as a way to transform society using better technology. We don't often get these opportunities. We've seen how um, information technology applied to very prosaic domains was able to transform them. You take mobile phones and little apps and you apply it to taxi cabs and you've got Uber, you've got Lyft. You, you take uh, regular web technologies, you apply it to hotels, you've got Airbnb. These are unicorns. Well, now you take IT, you take computer technology, couple it with the, with the advances that I just alluded to in distributed systems, and you apply it to finance. Well, then guess what happens? The transformation is immense. It's huge, and the value that's going to be created here is, uh, is very, very big. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I encourage all of you to take it, to, to use it, to transform society, to make it more open, more democratic. That's incredible advice, and it is transformative. I want to also save uh, a few minutes, and then I want to let Gun get back to the hackathon and the Avalanche Summit, and maybe take one or two questions from the audience for, 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 for Gun. Now, your hand went up first. Yes. So the 
Introduce yourself. What's your name? Where you are? Hello. My name is Max. Um, on, on Twitter, I'm Crypto Jesus. Uh, Twitter, you're what? Crypto Jesus. Crypto Jesus. So my question is, the main problems you address that Avalanche solves are scalability and ultimately cost, and also limited knowledge for proofs. So what I haven't heard is how Avalanche compares to scaling solutions for Ethereum, like ZK Sync and Arbitrum. Um, so why would I use Avalanche over a scaling solution that is more secure and um, ultimately low cost and high scalability like a, uh, a ZK rollup or an optimistic rollup? So for the business school students, his question was, how is a layer one compared to layer twos and what do you think about hiding information? Um, good. <laughs> you want to address that? Sure, absolutely. So Ethereum has a, has a scaling, uh, has an approach to scalability that relies on layer twos, a diversity of layer twos, uh, where essentially people take value off the chain, execute it off the chain, again, away from uh, scrutiny, and bring it back onto the chain. This is a wonderful approach. Whatever works on layer two also works on Avalanche. So if you like the layer two approach, if you think it's going to bring, you know, whatever, if you like to use it, that's fantastic. You, should, you can use it just as well on Avalanche. The fact that Avalanche is high capacity means that a lot of the problems that Ethereum will face when the, the, the second peg, the reverse, uh, reverse uh, settlement is happening on chain, a, lo a lot of those problems are relayed because we have the high capacity, we have the ability to, uh, to settle on chain much more quickly uh, in a way that, uh, that a more limited capacity chain cannot. But let's talk a little bit about the, the other approach, the, sort of the, what, is, what is Avalanche bringing to the system and what's, what's Ethereum doing? The layer two approach, is essentially a way of, uh, of a community saying, look, we have done all we can on layer one. We don't know how to move forward, and now we're tossing the ball up into the air. Each and every one of these layer twos is actually a way for the operators of those layer twos to make money at the expense of retail and users. The MEV opportunities on layer twos accrue to the people who operate the layer two, and that necessarily means, in fact, we'll have the implication that people who use those systems will be giving up execution in their trades, will be giving up whatever they're doing on the, the value that they're doing on chain to the operator of, uh, of the layer two. In short, you know, it's what it is, is a way that, uh, that Ethereum has gone, has done a lot of work, come all the way around to sadly reinvent the system as we know it. If I wanted to have a single, a single entity front run my trades or sandwich my trades, then I could easily go to TradFi and do that today. So in addition, the, uh, the, the scaling technique that we're using is unified, uniform, and elegant. The fact that these subnets are based on the same technology means that the same tooling, the same techniques that allow you to communicate with, let's say, our contract chain, allow you to communicate with everything else. Now, the layer two approach followed by, uh, by Ethereum will lead to fragmentation. It will fragment liquidity. It will fragment the user experience. The, the, opt, uh, the optimum experience is not the same as, um, the optimism experience is not the same as the arbitrum experience. The, uh, the, the folks who are, I have been saying this for some time and I think it's been underappreciated and I'm just patiently waiting for the community to find out that indeed when you fracture your, uh, your, your scaling, it, when you fracture your user community between different layer twos, you're going to find uh, that they are not happy because of the fact that these systems cannot communicate with each other and they have to employ different techniques for writing contracts and interacting with them. I can go on like this. But I think it comes down to a question of elegance and simplicity. We have a unified, simple solution in the form of asynchronous, heterogeneous blockchains, also known as subnets. And uh, Ethereum is essentially saying anything goes. Do whatever you can on top. The things that they do apply equally well to us, so we could employ them. But underneath it all, we don't have to resort to that. We give you something much simpler, and from a techie perspective, I think much more elegant. That's a wonderful answer. Um, I want to take one more from someone with a few wrinkles from the business school, the 25-year-old. Um, if you're from Harvard Business School and you have a question, raise your hand. They just study. They don't. OK, so who else? Uh, you were first. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Kingsbury. I'm an extension school graduate. 
Um, so last night I was looking at the uh, panelists and speakers. Uh, there are over 100 combined. Um, there are three black African American or African uh, amongst that. 21 only are women. So uh, with knowledge, that's why we're here, uh, we get great power and I think we have great responsibility is the cliche, but I believe in it. Um, what would you say in terms of uh, uh, this massive group of capital and, and elite folks uh, in terms of living up to that responsibility uh, that I believe we have uh, for somebody to kind of deliver that knowledge and power to somebody in the favelas of Brazil or the slums of New Delhi and, and so on and so forth. So how would you suggest providing that power and spreading that so that we don't increase uh, wealth gaps? That's a wonderful question. Um, I'm gonna give wonderful Gun a chance question. to answer and then afterwards, because I want him to go back to the summit, I can expound on my answers as well. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful question, that one that resonates with me quite deeply. In fact, there were two things that drove me into this space uh, you know, growing up uh, in, a, in, a, in a country in terms I was born in Istanbul and one of these uh, typical immigrant kids who came to the U.S. to study. I was very, very lucky along the way um, to, to get a scholarship. I ended up going to Princeton and became, becoming a professor at Cornell. Um, but one of the two things that drove me was the fact that when I was growing up, it was not, there were two things were not possible. One, it was not possible to build things that fully worked. Nothing worked to the 100% level, things that we take for granted. You go to the bank, the bank systems would be down. You go to the airport, the airport systems would be down, you wouldn't be able to check in. You close the window, the windows would, would not close entirely. I grew up in a very drafty house, for example. And that was just the way the things worked. That was part of the reason why I became an engineer, why I wanted to build things that always work, that could give you reliable guarantees. The second thing, though, was the fact that in a country, at least in, in my country at the time when I was growing up, it was not possible to affect change without permission. You needed to be connected. You needed to be in with the in crowd. You needed to be one of the chosen ones. Now, I am talking to the chosen ones, perhaps, um, but, uh, but that really drove me. And, uh, and so uh, what really drove me was the fact that the world needs to be much more open, much more democratized. This is especially true in finance, especially true because it's the gateway to everything else that happens afterwards. So um, when I was in graduate school, it would, it would take at least $150,000, which actually was worth a lot more than $150,000 just to have a feed to the New York Stock Exchange. So, uh, but now we're building these systems that open everything up. You and I and everybody else are on an equal footing when it comes to a properly designed blockchain system. So we're beginning, I think, on the technical side uh, to learn how to build systems that are e open and equal to all at a technical level, where the gatekeepers are just not there. So this is, this is an amazing responsibility. We need to protect it. We, need, we must not let this revolution be usurped in the, into directions where de facto gatekeepers suddenly appear where de facto gatekeepers suddenly, suddenly insert themselves between you and the system that you want to use. That's definitely one of them. The second part of this, though, is social and uh, perhaps also financial at the same time. Not only must we provide the proper technical, uh, technical grounding for creating a more equitable world, we also must ensure that people have access to this technology. We must socially reach out. We must give them the ways to socially contact each other, to build the communities, to, to create the connections that they need for their applications, their services, their businesses to thrive. That's one of the reasons why we built the, uh, why we organized the Avalanche Summit, at which I, I stand uh, today. That's why we're doing this hackathon with 500 amazing people from all sorts of life, all walks of life. And, uh, and I think, uh, I do have to admit that uh, in finance and in technology, we're quite behind in being diverse and equitable. And uh, this is something that resonates very strongly with me. We're doing everything that we can to open it up and we must uh, continue to push on that axis. And the final, maybe third thing I need to add is capital uh, to enable groups to, um, to, to change the world. Now, if you think about different walks of life, if you think about a cutting edge physicist, a cutting edge uh, biologist, 
they take enormous amounts of capital to get to the point where they can do world-changing things. Right? This machinery is expensive, complicated. And one of the things that drew me to computer science is that it doesn't take all that much to get a group of people to write some software that changed the world. At Harvard, you've studied many case studies where you saw how essentially a very small number of people in a garage were able to build billion dollar industries. So I'm hoping that, uh, that with just the right sensi sensibilities, the right infrastructure, the right technology, we can actually uh, try to make headway into this very, very difficult problem of making the world a better place. But thank you for bringing up the question. Thank you for that question. That was a great question. And um, I want to save the last 10 minutes here for the other questions that will come about. And I want to let Gun get back to the hackathon and the summit. So let's give them all a well round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I hope everything's been insightful and we got to get to some takeaways. So are there, oh my, that was so fast. Before I even get to ask questions. All right, so I mean, full disclosure. We're friends, so this is not going to be uh, too cutting a question, but I think it's a very important one for the, most of the crowd. Not the old guys like us, but the job seekers. Well, full so, disclosure, he was uh, HBS My Vintage. Right. So, so, John, look, I, 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 know, I know your path, because we, we sat at the Harvard Club in New York years ago and discussed this path, and what strikes me most about your success uh, is how you chose well. And for the job seeking, I said, maybe there'll be a decentralized model where they can make money, you know, uh, just moving from, from, uh, from pool to pool. That's fine. For the ones who are looking to choose a company, give them advice on how you chose to work with Able Labs. Before, because what, when I met you before, there was 10 guys in a room, you know, at a WeWork. Um, when they're thinking about which company to choose, it's, it's getting tougher. Because when you and I were, were, were choosing between hedge funds, you had about, I'd say, about a 30% chance of picking a good hedge fund. Now, if someone came to me and said, should I join a hedge fund, I'd say you got a better shot of winning the lottery. So it's getting more difficult to choose the quality companies from the jokers. And so what advice would you have for these top graduates who have a choice of where to work in DeFi and Web3? How did you pick this company and what should they look for? Well, for me, I think I said already, Gun and I had known each other because we were the first uh, advisors to the Cornell University Blockchain Club. And frankly, for me, it's always been about some sort of community or team. Um, I grew up playing team sports. I actually played a little baseball and football in college. And to me, it was always about, like, I'm a better version of myself if I can help motivate that person and his energy helps motivate me and we become both better versions of ourselves and the team gets better. I think of blockchain and crypto is literally a giant community where we can all make better versions of ourselves if we work together. And that's rare. You don't find that in Web 2. In Web 2, actually, you take someone's personal data and then you resell it to advertisers and then you try to convince this person to buy more and to think this way, and then you sell more to advertisers. It's about, you know, really is about working with other people, building communities that can help you be better versions of yourself. That's the meta answer. But specifically why Ava Labs and Ava Lanch is because I saw this as a, a, a technology that can solve the problems that enable me to get my mission accomplished which is, again, to tokenize assets, do it in a compliant way, and then have that accessibility to everyone. If people in this room want to go buy Stripe, the new private stocks of today, they should be able to. Why should it only be the VCs? Now, I know there's a bunch of VCs here, so don't kill me afterwards, but like, um, they should have some access to that instead of just buying you know, the public share after the valuations have increased a lot. Thank you very much for putting together this event. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm a second year student at the business school along with these guys. Um, I have a question regarding the jobs to be done framework. So what, that's uh, <laughs> from Clay Christensen. Um, so what is, what are the jobs to be done for Web2 folks getting into Web3 using um, Avalanche and interacting? What's the first product or vertical that will be used by everyone? So what's the first product that will be? Or vertical that will be used by people who are not interacting with Web3 at the moment. OK, so how is it going to affect the individual or the institutions? Either one? Uh, either one. OK, so from, I'll answer both. From the institutional side, 
Um, Ava Labs has a partnership with Deloitte. Deloitte is actually building a subnet and is already building on top of the Avalanche platform for their end client, FEMA. So and when there is disaster recovery that happens, unfortunately, in this country, you need to exchange information and value all at the same time. And you got to get money to the right people uh, who are the victims of you know, hurricanes or whatever. So we are creating a partnership with Deloitte, and Deloitte's building a subnet on top of Avalanche so that they can provide applications and accessibility to FEMA and all these individuals, insurance companies, and third-party service providers, because you have thousands of people who have to clear trees and pay things and build houses all over again. So that's an example of how it's already helping people on the institutional level. On the personal level, again, you guys should, it's better than I tell you how to get involved. You should get into the DeFi ecosystem, start playing with these applications, and you'll learn for yourself how quickly things can be done, how good the experience is, and then you get to decide how you allocate your money. Sorry, you've been asking and holding it. Hi, my name's Chuck. I did not go to Harvard, but my friend here who did invited me. But this is not gonna sound kind of weird. I work for the FDIC. I'm not here in an official capacity. I'm here for personal things. But being inside that space, um, they are trying to now, of course, we're five years behind, as, as you, know, you know. But they are now trying to understand the space. And unfortunately, we're, um, they're still slow to adopt. So. Outside of that, what do you see? I see them very pro crypto. They're very, they're not against it. And that's what a lot of people think, like the government, oh, the government's gonna come in and really regulate it and everything thing like that. At least on my end, it's more of how to protect the consumers in case institutions get into it and like leverage their liquidity against uh, coins and everything, how they're gonna protect their money. What do you see is the biggest um, roadblock for, for, for all that to really come together and be um, uh, protect the consumer and also have it to where crypto is more of a positive thing for the, for the general population. Great, thank you for that question. That's a very important question. And for those of you who don't know, FDIC provides insurance for your uh, bank account so that if something really bad happens, you know, there's a backstop. And can we go over? Is it okay if we go over? That, that'll be great. Um, that's a great question because right now, you know, people say, well, DeFi is all this, you know, high reward. Um, but those of you who've been working in investment firms, you know, high reward comes for high risk. There's really two products out there right now. You know, in the DeFi world, yes, you're getting high reward. Part of that reward is because you're disintermediating intermediaries. Part of that reward is because, frankly, there's a lot of incentive programs as well. But what people need to realize is that there is a lot of risk and new types of risk. There's a, the human greed factor risk. There's typical structure product risks of having leverage or too much risk in the traditional world. And there's a risk of technology and rug pulls and all that stuff. So yes, you're getting a high reward, but you don't have the intermediaries like an FDIC to provide safety net. So everyone should be aware of that. The second path is that Go, like going to Goldman instead of Tiger for me. It was like, you have these intermediaries like an FDIC that has insurance. So you're good, and each one of these intermediaries takes out some of that reward. Some of them, these intermediaries, unfortunately, are now just squatting and taking their Schumpeterium rents instead of actually providing a real service. But there are real services like FDIC to provide safety. So if you want more safety, and it should be choice, you should go to more of a traditional FDIC insured type place to put your money, but you will get a lower reward. You're not going to get both. What is happening right now, and I know companies are trying to build on top of Avalanche, is insurance products like this. And that's one of the big areas of focus going forward where people are trying to figure that out. Now, we also had an announcement with, with Lemonade where we are trying to figure out you know, insurance uh, products and they're gonna do it on top of, of Avalanche. So people are trying to work on this and figure it out. But everyone should be aware of higher risk, higher reward. And you have to decide which ends of the spectrum. And ultimately there are gonna be many rails and you can decide what risk profile is better for yourself.
I'm Jack Jacobs, and building upon the role of government um, and the future of blockchain, how do you see central bank digital currencies, specifically ECNY, which is already being rolled out in China, and the potential of the United States getting into this space, and the potential on the one hand for more centralization, more than we've ever seen, while on the other hand, um, better enabling uh, the crypto space to thrive? So you go to Harvard College? Uh, I do not. Okay, you look very young. I'd be out there <laughs> yes. doing things right now. Thanks for coming by at Saturday morning at 9 a.m. That's pretty incredible. Uh, actually, the HBS people, when I was here, I wouldn't be here either at 9 a.m. So thanks for coming by as well. Um, so I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about U.S. dollar becoming more of a reserve currency. There are probably like over, last I counted, um, there are over 150 countries out there trying to work on some sort of CBDC. Um, you mentioned the one in China, and that actually is one that's actually very scary in my opinion, because they are taking the benefits of you know, the blockchain, but making it even more centralized. They're basically collecting more and more data on people instead of making it you know, um, uh, pseudonymous, if you will. And that will be, I don't think that's a long-term system that will really work. I think part of the reason why the U.S. may be a little bit behind in this world of creating CBDCs, you know, the Fed is working on it, um, is because I think it goes back to what I said earlier. When there's hyper-tokenization, you're going to need a bridge between all of these. And I think still it's going to be the, the, the reserve currency will still be the U.S. dollar. But again, this is an open system. People are allowed to work on what they want to work on. This is the inclusion that allows it. I just hope the right systems are the ones that are more inclusive than the ones who use the technology for other things. This is a question that's going to, in all the five disruptive technologies of 2030, the, the students at HBS need to study and think about. One more question? Or no, nope, I'm getting the wrap it up now. So I just want to thank you guys all for coming. It is really a, all right, one more question. She just won't. Hi, um, thank you so much. My name is Leslie. Um, so you mentioned you started your career you know, in hedge fund. Obviously, when you're investing in hedge fund, you can long and short, hedge out some risks you don't want. Um, and I think all of us here agree that blockchain is going to change the world. Um, you seem to have really strong conviction in Avalanche specifically, you know, the like random sampling protocol and whatsoever. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, between, you know, dedicating your entire career to one particular protocol versus you know, being at a VC, investing in different protocols, hedging out some of that idiosyncratic risk. When you decided to join Avalanche yourself, like, how did you um, think about that from like a career risk perspective? Yeah, thanks. That's that's a, you know, that's building upon this gentleman's question earlier. You know, I, I joined Avalanche and Avalaz because I saw the potential in the technology, and I saw the vision of Gun, which is similar to mine, or helped me accomplish my my mission. And I also saw the early people and what he wanted to build in terms of community. It really was about. In this summit that, that was so great, it's not about the 160 people at Ava Labs. Ava, you know, it's more about the, the 3,500 you know, developers and hacker, ha hackers that came to contribute. So I wanted to see the right vision, and I wanted to see the right technology, is your answer. Now, the very most important thing I, I forgot to mention is you guys are still wondering, you know, what was that big, you know, who's that speaker, and what was that big takeaway that he gave to to us. The person was Jack Welch. He was CEO of General Electric, and at the time, that was one of the largest companies in the world, and he was uh, you know, thought of as one of the best business leaders around. And what he said was, every night, you need to spend 15, 20 minutes before you go to bed and reflect. You need to reflect about what you did, what you want to accomplish tomorrow, and then bring it up to a meta level and think about the bigger picture of what you're accomplishing in life. And if you do that every single day and you constantly refine it and quest constantly question yourself and do it, um, then you will become better at whatever you do. That was the big takeaway, and I've been practicing that. I put a little twist on it. I do it two hours before I go to bed, and for you guys to figure out what, why two hours before, it's gonna have to be for next year's conference. 
So I want to thank you and thank all of the conference promoters. <laughs>